yeah, you you know already my name, um, but I uh, I can introduce myself uh, self in, in in multiple ways. Uh, but I will tell you something about uh, England dunes, about uh, a desert-like habitat in the Netherlands, and. Um, this is part of my PhD, which, which I did at the University of Amsterdam. Um, and currently I'm working at, as a biologist uh, at uh, an organization, BLWG. And I work on the monitoring and uh, protection of endangered plants, mosses, lichens in the Netherlands. And, well, first, you read already something about uh, uh, about inland dunes. Um, so, so what happened in the Netherlands or in Western Europe? How did they? Um, how were the the uh, inland dunes created? They were created by the removal of trees. Yeah. Uh, this like provides you know space to land in a way that. Yeah, well, at least it's it's a it's a man-made habitat, so it's uh, uh, it's, it's not a natural phenomenon. Uh, and after the well, first you had the ice age, that's about fifteen thousand years ago, and then about eight thousand years ago, people came to came here in this region to uh, uh, to live and to start agriculture by removing trees. So there was a lot of forest, natural forest before, and then most of it was transformed in heathland. Um, so you see all the, the small purple shrubs, they flower in, the, in, in autumn. And um, you could do uh, sheep grazing, for example, cattle um, also uh, uh, make small uh, parcels with, for example, uh, 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 wheat or um, uh, other well things you can you can grow to uh, to live uh, from to eat uh, all kinds of crops. Um, but then in the um, uh, between the 16th and 19th century, so not so long ago, uh, especially sheep. Uh, became a, a, a big economic factor, so there, were, there were a lot of sheep grazing in this habitat, and what happened was that it was completely overgrazed, and some parts uh, were transformed in these kind of deserts. And um, in the dunes are well, the effect of erosion, so you, you get, uh, for example, wind and water erosion, and uh, the sand is blown uh, up to dunes, so you have this this uh, uh, original uh, well, forest and heathland soil, thick soil. But if that is damaged, you get uh, erosion by wind. So the sand is transported from a certain site well, to a, a, a couple of well, hundred meters further, and you get the dune. And uh, in an inland dune landscape, you have all these dunes in a, in a kind of pattern. And you can only get inland dunes at places where uh, the, the soil is, is, is suitable. So there are, there are only limited parts in, in Europe where it can occur. And you see the gray band here, and also top of spots in England, and this is a place where uh, during the Ice Age, after the Ice Age, uh, sand was also blown in a kind of polar desert, and this in this band, the sand was deposited that had exactly the right size of uh, sand grains, so the sand grains that, uh, that can be blown uh, up to dunes, and in this area you have more uh, bedrock, some more solid rock and larger granules. And here you have uh, something that's called lus, that's a more uh, finer uh, dust-like sand. And uh, that was blown further away from, uh, from the uh, Arctic. 
And now, uh, yeah, this this habitat is considered a uh, protected area, uh, yeah, protected areas, a rare kind of habitat, although it's completely man-made, but it has a long history. And um, within the Netherlands, you see uh, that within this band of the, it's called the cover cover sands, uh, inland dunes were uh, quite common. So this is a map which shows all the places where inland dunes have existed. But only a limited number of them are still there. So uh, for example, in, if, if you, if you uh, put a map over it where, where this open sand is still present, it's less than 1%. And um, well, what happens with the desert habitat in the Netherlands? Uh, you hear a, a lot of uh, about desertification. So in uh, in southern Europe, in Africa, um, people are afraid of, of deserts because they try to expand with the climate change. If the climate becomes only a little bit drier, uh, parts of the Mediterranean will uh, will start to uh, to become a desert-like habitat with no vegetation. Uh, but in uh, Western Europe, the climate, of course, is, is suitable for growing plants, and uh, the inland dunes will start to grow. Uh, the vegetation will, will start to grow back in the inland dunes. So first you get heath, and then you get forest when you wait long enough. And um, during my study, uh, I looked at this vegetation succession, how fast it goes, and what kind of factors. Um, affect the, the, the uh, speed of the succession. A succession is all the, 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 the several uh, types of vegetation that fo follow up. So uh, usually the sand is first covered by algae, mosses, and lichens. So they are very tiny uh, uh, plants that do not grow uh, deep in the soil. Um, but eventually they, they make a kind of soil. When they, when they die off, you get more carbon in the, uh, in the upper soil layer. And that's a good, a good uh, base for grasses and shrubs to grow. And eventually you get uh, a, a very thick soil, uh, which is suitable for trees. And then you get the forests. Um, so the, the main uh, vegetation types you find in inland dunes are <coughs> bare sand with with or without uh, small uh, tufts of grass. Um, the next stage is a grassland with uh, lots of mosses and lichens, some primitive plants. And then the next stage is, is heathland and forest. And um, well, forest is the natural habitat here, if you, if you don't do anything, the whole country will become a forest. Um, so all the other uh, stages in the, in the vegetation succession uh, need to be, well, maintained by, by, by man. Um, and that, that's what I think uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the last week uh, Lex told you about about uh, uh, yeah, the, the conservation of the inland dunes. But I will show you some, uh, some pictures of how the uh, sand becomes colonized by, uh, uh, by mosses and lichens. Here you see a certain moss called polytrichum. It grows uh, with small, uh, well, a couple of millimeter large uh, 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 small plants which are connected below the soil. So, and uh, they leave a lot of space with bare sand where slowly other um, species will, uh, will invade and you get a very species rich uh, so a, a, a habitat with lots of um, species that, uh, that are restricted to inland dunes and that are, um, uh, well, only formed in a, in a small part of the succession. So you, the, these uh, species are, uh, well, uh, confined to inland dunes, 
and uh, well, they need to be protected in some way, otherwise they, they have no space uh, anywhere else to grow. Um, so if you, if you look at the biodiversity uh, value of inland dunes, uh, you see, um, well, one vegetable plant, five mosses, tripheids, and 19 ligands that occur uh, in the Netherlands only in uh, inland dunes. Well, those numbers are not very high if you compare it to a, a square kilometer in the rainforest. Uh, you will have uh, more than, uh, probably more than 5,000 species. Um, but in, in the Netherlands, this is already uh, uh, quite a lot. Um, so we're talking about, well, how these inland dunes uh, were formed, <coughs> and then about the threats. So you see that uh, in the past 100 years, about 99% of this inland dune area uh, was lost. So it's now forest again. And uh, here you see uh, how, it, and there is about 40 hectares left, that's about well, four square kilometers um, of, of open sand. Um, so the main factors are changed land use, so uh, after the Second World War a lot of people were uh, put to work to, uh, to plant forests in these areas uh, and at that time they um, well they thought let's make let's make these deserts uh, more profitable and uh, uh, so so we invest in planting trees so in about 100 years we can uh, get a lot of uh, money from the from the woods so, um, there was also the succession, so in areas that were uh, conserved as a nature uh, reserve, uh, there was no maintenance. So um, in the past you had these sheep grazing, salt cutting, sort of soil removal, and yeah, that, that was something yeah, that was medieval, uh, uh, from medieval times, so people are not doing that anymore. Um, so you get this succession, uh, then start to grow there and eventually you have more forest. Um, and another uh, factor is the impact of nitrogen deposition. Um, we had a lot of air pollution in the 1950s to 1980s from, uh, in, from the industry, uh, sulfur dioxide, acid rain. Um, nowadays, the, the main form of pollution is uh, nitrogen coming from mainly from agriculture, so from, uh, from uh, farms where uh, lots of uh, chicken and cows are put together and they produce a lot of uh, uh, ammonia especially and it can, can be transported through the air over several kilometers and it will also reach uh, nature reserves and then, well, it's like manure putting manure on a, uh, on a crop field, it, it will speed up the succession, so uh, you get plants will grow more easily on the, on the sand uh, with the nitrogen uh, than without. Um, and um, although you can really measure the, the speed of succession, you will see that the vegetation, the, the plants that grow in the inland dunes are um, uh, change very quickly due to the uh, nitrogen. Uh, there's more grass and less smaller species, so the, the vegetation becomes more, more higher and more uh, less structured. Um, and there's also an invasive species, a, a moss species that comes from uh, the southern hemisphere, from Australia. Um, and that's also promoted by uh, nitrogen deposition. Well, this is uh, something you're going to do in your project. Um, and I did this comparing two pictures, aerial photographs uh, from long ago and, and some, some more recent, um, for eight uh, inland dunes. And, um, so as you can
can see in the, in, in the 1950s, in this area, the, you saw a lot of bare sand, uh, some forest, and uh, nowadays the same uh, area is, um, uh, is, is much more vegetated. So the, most of the, of the bare sand is now covered with, covered with mosses. Uh, and there are al also um, uh, some, some patches with grass here, and, uh, uh, and for example, this whole area is, is grown, uh, overgrown. But you also see that, uh, that the pattern of trees here is more or less the same. So <coughs> people kept that, I think, as a kind of, well, really, there are usually trees on a high view, and they, they look pretty, so they want to keep them. So you see effects from both management and natural, well, influences. Um, so it's another part from a picture from 1947. Um, you see more dramatic and, uh, change. Um, so I, I classified the aerial photographs in three uh, classes. Uh, bear sand, uh, the, the grasslands, and uh, heath and forest. So uh, heath and forest cannot be distinguished very well in old uh, black and white photographs. Um, so they're they're taken together, so they have more or less the same uh, soil type. Which are the types? Grasses, lichens, uh, Yeah. The, yeah. The, the precise piece we, we can look in uh, outside, and we uh, so after this talk uh, we go yeah. uh, in the field and we we have a look there, and uh, so you can see uh, some of the uh, examples. The polytrichum is is a moss. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So the uh, here the polytrichum, uh, them That's. Uh, the dominating uh, uh, most species in uh, in Indian dunes, yeah. yeah. And uh, Cornetras is uh, kind of yeah blue gray uh, tuft like grass. So that it's a, s a single uh, tuft of, uh, of grass, and and they they are dispersed over the sand. So they're really the first uh, colonizers, and they can also disappear quickly. So they're usually there for a couple of years, and then it gets blown over by. Uh, by a new June, and then it disappears again. But sometimes, when it stabilizes the soil, it, it can go further in the succession. And and these um, these things are more or less um, yeah, you, you cannot go back from there. Only by uh, by conservation measures, by removing vegetation. So I. Um, yeah, this process was was done by uh, um, the, the converting the uh, the aerial photographs to um, uh, to a factor uh, layer was, was done by the Finian's developer. Uh, that, that's a kind of advanced uh, program, um, but I think you can do the same uh, with the um, function in Arctis that changes um, raster images to uh, to polygons, um, and the other. Uh, option to do is is the other way is to uh, draw the boundaries by hand. So you can, for example, uh, yeah, uh, you, you you put you take the um, the aerial photograph, you have to dereference it, and then you draw the lines uh, around the uh, uh, forest borders. For example. That's a little bit more work, but I think it, yeah, it's probably worth it because the, uh, the raster to factor function is probably not so um, not so suitable. You have to uh, to look at all the settings uh, about uh, the, the minimum size of the area, etc. So. Um, Okay, when, when you go, when you look to uh, look at the changes 
uh, in the vegetation uh, in these eight areas together, so all kinds of indigenous sites uh, from over the, the, the Netherlands. Uh, you see that between uh, the 1950s, it's an average for, well, let's say 1940 to 1960, um, and then exact uh, time periods, 1981, 95, 2007, you see a more or less uh, linear um, decline of the area of sand. Uh, you see a, a, a slight increase of pioneer vegetation, which is less than you would expect. Um, and you see a very steep increase of forest area. And of course, this difference can be explained by the fact that in this period, uh, after the Second World War, so in, in the 1940s and 50s, uh, forest was planted, so that with that uh, kind of management, yeah, you skip this stage with pioneer vegetation. So most of the bare sand was immediately transformed into forest. And of course, trees cannot grow in, uh, in just uh, sand. So they added all kind of stuff to, uh, uh, they even put uh, uh, turf from, uh, uh, in it, uh, all kind of things, manure, uh, to make the soil more, um, uh, better suitable for, for trees to grow. Now if you extrapolate this, you, would, you wouldn't have any bare sand left at a certain moment, so around 2017, and that's uh, uh, that's of course uh, yeah that's bad news because uh, according to the European Habitat Directive, the, the European rules uh, says uh, say that we have to keep the same amount of human beings in the Netherlands forever, and uh, when we do that, we get uh, well, the, the, uh, the conservation uh, people get some money to maintain the area. And, uh, uh, and just by, by removing trees when they start growing in the, in the, uh, in the sand, uh, by uh, <coughs> removing the soil uh, once every couple of decades. So it's, it's not something you have to do every year. Um, and that uh, looks like this. So uh, when people walk around in a nature reserve and they see uh, which kind of activities they're usually a bit frightened and they think, uh, well, uh, why? Uh, so they, they usually put some plates there why, why they are doing this. It takes only uh, probably a couple of weeks to, uh, to clear a very large area. And uh, uh, well, you, you would think, where, where is all this going? So it's a, a little bit of grass and moss and a little bit of sand. They usually distribute it to, to several uh, uh, destinations. Uh, for example, the moss and grasses uh, seed out, and they will bring that to farmers as uh, or make compost of it. And uh, the sand is usually uh, uh, also used in, uh, for example, building projects. So if a road is built somewhere, you can use this sand to. Uh, to um, yeah, to, to use it, you cannot throw away such a large amount. Oh yeah, um, and then my, during my my uh, research at the University of Amsterdam, I, I looked especially at the influence of, uh, of nitrogen deposition at uh, on the vegetation and soil. Um, so I will, I will explain something more of that. Uh, one of the things is so what what happens when you compare um, what happens in the soil and plants when you compare uh, two areas, one of which is in the north of the Netherlands, in a very clean uh, site with no agricultural activities in the vicinity, and one uh, in an area where big farms are just at, at one or two kilometers distance. So you have a lot of ammonia in the air and when you look at the at the soil 
when you take soil samples from just the upper uh, five centimeters of soil, uh, you will see that in the site with a lot of uh, nitrogen deposition and with a high ammonia concentration in the air, uh, that the soil contains a lot more uh, nitrogen than in clean areas. Um, and uh, well, in most of the areas, nitrogen is also limiting the vegetation growth. So as, as soon as you add a little bit of nitrogen, plants grow faster. Um, and a plant that especially grows faster when you add some, um, some nitrogen is this uh, moss, an exotic species, uh, invasive species from uh, the southern hemisphere. Um, it, uh, yeah, due to, thanks to monitoring of, uh, of mosses in the Netherlands, we know that uh, the, the species uh, uh, rapidly increased and is now present everywhere in the country. But it has a preference for uh, well, acid uh, substrates, so uh, like things like rotting wood, um, uh, sand, um, and it, it needs to be very dry. It also grows on, uh, on the roofs, sometimes uh, uh, sunny places. Um, but it's never, it's, it's not everywhere a problem. So this, this species is, is usually growing in tiny patches and in some areas it becomes very dominant. So you get um, many, many uh, square meters uh, with only this species and uh, it, it will uh, also cause um, the, 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 the effect that uh, other species cannot grow there, so uh, you get a replacement of the native vegetation by this single exotic moss. Um, so let's let's proceed. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. We showed a picture that um, that was showing the um, the coverage of the decapulopus. Yeah. But um, that so um, today it looks like. There's a lot of it in, in the Netherlands, but um, it, it could be that it's only uh, like it's, it's seen over there. It's just a, a patch. Of yeah, 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 yeah. A few centimeters. And then so the uh, on uh, you saw those the, the maps where, yeah. where the species increased. Uh, yeah, it can be uh, a, a, a tiny bit yeah. or uh, a lot. Yeah, it, it's only present absence. Yeah. 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 Uh, Yeah, 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 and it, this this was for the Netherlands, but it's in entire Western Europe uh, already. Um, but it, it doesn't it doesn't become a problem everywhere. So uh, many of these exotic species are just an addition to the native flora, and they're not they're not harmful. Uh, but sometimes, under certain circumstances, they do. And in this case, in sites with uh, with nitrogen deposition. Uh, Compilipus interflexus, so this moss will completely outgrow the entire vegetation. You see uh, one green uh, moss knot, and the normal vegetation in this, at the same place would be would look like this. So a more diverse um, uh, place with <coughs> the grass is the same, uh, but here in between there's much more space for uh, for other species to grow. So here you need to grow smaller than this moss knot, uh, shorter, um, they're, they're about half of the, of the number. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, sites, the different sites, um, and you, uh, I, took, I made transects of uh, 20 meters and I looked at every segment of one meter, um, if uh, computers this moss and or lichens were starting to grow in a in this in the uh, native moss moths. It's a, uh, the first uh, stage of pioneer vegetation. And um, if you make a diagram with it, like here with the ammonia air concentration, so which is a measurement for the for the amount of nitrogen uh, deposition, 
you see a, a line that goes up. So the, the um, in, at the moment that this that the species, the, the competing species, the native and the exotic species, start to grow, uh, that that is already influenced by uh, by uh, by nitrogen deposition. And uh, so there you have already the, that's probably the best uh, way to demonstrate it, that uh, the nitrogen deposition promotes the settlement of, uh, of, of this exotic moss. And when you look at a, a much larger, larger scale of, of entire nature reserves, and you say, well, uh, in this nature reserve, it, this moss species, this exotic moss species is uh, either uh, absent, more or less absent, or only in very small amounts. It's locally abundant, it's, or it's almost everywhere. Um, and you, uh, you take the amount of nitrogen deposition, and you take the average over a, a number of, um, uh, of sites, and you also see uh, that when the moss species is becomes more dominant, it's also correlated with the, um, uh, with the nitrogen deposition. So it's also proof that uh, that there is a relation between nitrogen and the, uh, and the moss species. Um, yeah, and it, and usually the the, the moss moth will start growing as a very thin layer and then eventually it becomes a, a four centimeter thick um, moss layer with only uh, parts above the soil. So there's, you see, you see bare sand here, the moss on, on top, and it's, it's not going deeper. So you can also easily remove it when, uh, when the circumstances are better, in probably in closer when there's less nitrogen. Um, and here you also see that uh, this, this is still a young moss. Uh, this is a native moss, the Polytrichum species. This is a lichen species. And you see that these native species get almost strangled by, uh, by the exotic species. So uh, as soon as this uh, the exotic species grows a little bit higher, uh, there's no room for the, for the native species anymore. They will be covered. And uh, when you look at the, um, well the, the number of lichen species that, that I showed that already uh, on, a, on, a, on a previous slide, which is here you see the uh, in, in sites with high and low nitrogen deposition, uh, the number of, of lichen species per, uh, uh, per square meter um, is, is plotted here. So this is a very species rich area, a species poor area, and um, you see that, uh, that in high deposition areas, the, the average number of lichen species is much lower. Okay, um, yeah, when you, when you look at the area around here, around Breda, uh, there are a number of inland dune sites. Um, so we are now here and um, all these orange yellow uh, <coughs> uh, sites are inland dunes and um, there are two different colors. The, the orange is uh, the area where inland dune soils exist. So the, uh, somewhere in the past uh, there was uh, there was open sand, so it has a kind of dune landscape, but it's now covered by forests. And when you walk in the forest, you see the the, the hills and uh, with the trees just placed random uh, on it. And um, in the yellow areas, there is still open sand or or pioneer vegetation. So today this. Uh, just uh, in half an hour, we will go here. Uh, it's called Cadette Camp. It's an old military 
site where they uh, were shooting and uh, throwing grenades and bombs. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons uh, that that site is still open uh, because um, uh, yeah, otherwise people won't use it anymore. So uh, many, many of these uh, inner dunes were used as, as military terrains where, um, uh, where uh, soldiers on horses, etc., et uh, or, or tanks uh, would go around. Uh, and, and that's also a reason that, uh, that there is still sand. It's also in this area, Lonesome Dunes and Dyna, and that's what, what, you, what the talk uh, last week was about. And um, where you have uh, got the uh, aerial photographs from this, uh, this site. Um, so as you can see, th there's not much left, especially uh, apart from, from this area, there's not, not much left in, uh, from the original open human dune landscape. Uh, uh, but there is a lot of potential if you want to restore the habitat site. You can simply go to an, one of these orange areas, remove the forest, and you get a, a, a fresh uh, dune again. Um, and this is how the, the well, nearest inner dune site in Veda looks like. So you see uh, here's the, uh, the highway, uh, and there's just this, this little patch. With, uh, with bare sand, and you see lots of paths, so most of the sand will still be open because of uh, human activity, just by go there and uh, go for a hike or a motor crossing. Uh, and uh, that also creates sharp differences between the forest margin and the, and the sand. So there's only a little bit of uh, pioneer vegetation. It's not, not really an example of, uh, of um, natural succession in, in vegetation. Um, and now in this part, uh, especially in this site, uh, you will uh, see some, uh, some, uh, some of the, uh, the natural vegetation. Okay, that's, oh yeah, and that's the way how we get there. Uh, so we are now here. And uh, we, we go with bicycle. Do you have to? Did you bring your bicycle? Yeah. Uh, okay. So we go. Well, this is the place on Google Maps where it is called Cadet and Camp. But we can also go uh, uh, probably here. And then this, this is the open area. Uh, that's a yeah. That's a last one. Okay.